The house always wins. If you've ever taken a trip to Las Vegas before, you are sure to be reminded of this fact after you've gambled away your last penny. Though the bright lights, addicting sounds, and tales of jackpots make us believe a huge win is right around the corner, this facade is nothing but a well-formulated and expertly constructed illusion designed to part you from success, as the rules and odds are forever stacked against the participant. Now watching this, surely you're thinking that this casino metaphor is a clever way of describing Rafael Nadal's complete domination at Roland Garros, a Grand Slam tournament he has won a record 13 times at the time of this recording, compiling a mind-boggling 100-2 win-loss record. Well, you're mistaken. The casino is a clever way to describe a typical match against any top player, where a competitor has at least some chance of winning. As history has shown, playing a tennis match against Rafael Nadal at Roland Garros is the equivalent to betting on the rigged three-card Monte confidence scam taking place in the alley behind the casino, where no matter how prepared or confident you are to take on the dealer, you will unquestionably lose every single time, typically in embarrassing fashion. But wait, his record at the tournament. In Nadal's two losses at the French Open, his most recent beating came at the hands of Novak Djokovic in 2015, whose level of play that year has constituted towards what many consider one of the greatest seasons ever seen in men's tennis. His other loss? To this guy. In 2009, Robin Soderling shocked the world when he defeated the then number one ranked and four-time defending champion in the fourth round of Roland Garros, sending analysts into a frenzy to determine just how he accomplished a feat no man had yet achieved though it was later revealed that a diagnosis of long-term knee tendinitis had potentially hampered his level of play against the Swede, it's important to note that Nadal had otherwise been experiencing one of his best periods of success to date, having already won five tournaments out of the seven finals made that year. What made Soderling's performance against Nadal so interesting was how it contrasted to their previous two matchups. Just one month earlier, Nadal defeated Soderling 6-1-6-0 in an overwhelming one-sided clay court affair at the Rome Masters, demonstrating how Nadal was more than match fit to defeat Soderling during that time period. Two years prior, however, Soderling took Nadal to five sets at Wimbledon in a match that while full of mental gymnastics from the Swede, exemplified how his particular style of play can work so effectively against Nadal's game, a secret yet reliable key that a few select players have used throughout history to defeat Rafael Nadal but rarely employed at Roland Garros. So what was Soderling's secret to defeating Nadal in Paris? And how can others, even those with much lower rankings, do the same? Rafael Nadal is undoubtedly one of the greatest tennis players to ever walk the earth. But what makes his reign on clay, particularly at one tournament, so supreme? While the Spaniard has built his game around a specific methodical style of play well suited for the surface, brute force domination. If we analyze a typical Nadal match on clay, you'll notice following the serve and return exchange that Rafa will immediately target the opponent's weaker stroke and set up a V formation on the court, where because Nadal's heavy topspin forces the ball to bounce incredibly high and deep, the opponent has no choice but to defensively return the ball right back to Nadal, who will keep the opponent guessing as to when he'll finally change direction, otherwise known as the battering ram technique. Underneath their feet, clay as a court surface material is slow and high bouncing. Whereas heavy hitting opponents avoid the battering ram on the faster hardened grass courts by having strong service games which keeps Nadal on defense, clay courts effectively eliminate the advantage that powerful serves have by slowing down the ball considerably, allowing a certain player who just happens to be the all-time best clay court receiver by a long shot ample time to read and react to anything coming. So we understand why clay complements the Nadal game, but what is it about Roland Garros in particular that amplifies his abilities? A keen eye while watching the Spaniards' matches will remind you that Rafa doesn't just play on any court in Paris, but of course receives stadium billing every single outing, on none other than court Philippe Chatrier. The significance? Though a typical regulation-sized tennis court, such as those found outside the main stadium, are 78 feet in length with approximately 20 to 25 feet of playing space behind each baseline, Court Philippe Chatrier contains 32 feet of playing space behind each baseline, making it the second largest Grand Slam court in the world. Said Novak Djokovic, For an opponent playing against Nadal and Chatrier, it seems that you have to put double as much effort than any other court in the world, because it's so much space and it feels like you can't make a winner. Combined with the favorably warm June weather conditions which promote higher bounces and greater spin velocity, key elements of his game, it's easy to see why Nadal is virtually unbeatable at this particular event right? Though still considered a monumental upset today, Nadal's 2009 loss to Soderling isn't the only time he's been dealt a shock upset early in a major. In fact, far from it. 
While unique in their own particular playstyles, each of these players share extremely apparent characteristics that have been shown to be Rafa's Achilles heel, a recipe of sorts which has proven effective for lesser ranked players on rare occasions to target Nadal's few weaknesses. Contrary to expectations, Nadal's ideal opponent would be a player very similar to himself, just slightly worse. When playing former familiar foe David Ferrer, who shares a similar game to Nadal, yet holds a career 6-26 win-loss record against, Nadal thrives when given high loopy topspin balls to return, as the height and speed they conform to on clay consistently finds their way into the quick foot in Nadal's ideal strike zone almost every point. As a player whose famed behind-the-head forehand finish necessitates a contact point of at least chest-to-shoulder height to achieve the heavy topspin his strokes have foundation in, it should come as no surprise that Nadal struggles against players who hit their ground strokes the exact opposite way, flat. When Robin Soderling hits a forehand, two defining characteristics are noted after the ball first makes contact with the ground. The ball does not bounce high, and the ball will skid along the surface. In an effort to retrieve a skidding ball whose contact point lies below his waist, Nadal will resort to less topspin, less body weight transfer, and use more wrist when attempting to maintain his spin and depth, yet results in a return that lands far shorter and with far less pace than usual, a vicious cycle against any flat-hitting player. In retrospect, Soderling has since noted, I went into the match with absolutely nothing to lose and everything to win. I didn't know how to play with topspin anyway, so I just played even flatter. While the type of ground stroke spin received, or lack thereof, certainly plays into Nadal's success, a far deadlier strategy relies not on something you can use against him, but rather take away from him. Time. If you don't already know, I'm going to let you in on an open secret within the tennis community. Rafa Nadal hates indoor hardcourts. Compared to the 62 titles the Spaniard has won on clay, the number of indoor hardcourt titles to his name? One. And it wasn't a cakewalk to achieve that either. So why the obvious disdain for a surface environment that by contrast, a player like Federer thrives on? Well simply, they play fast. Really fast. As the lack of sun, wind, and humidity remove any additional weight or drag on a tennis ball, all strokes receive a noticeable improvement in pace. Despite his trademark speed, Nadal loves nothing more than to take his time setting up his shots when strategizing against opponents, a trademark tactic he'll employ when standing up to 19 feet behind the baseline to allow extra time in receiving serves coming at an excess of 140 miles per hour. Now, how can we use this information to our advantage on clay? When looking back to when the relatively unknown Daniel Brands almost led Nadal by two sets to love in the first round of Roland Garros 2013, match footage will show that in addition to possessing flat, powerful strokes, Brands spared no expense in getting the ball back to Nadal as fast and deep as possible every point. Whether it be standing on the baseline for service returns, taking every ball on the rise, or making an effort to approach the net on many points, what the 59th ranked player lacked in skill was more than made up for with far superior strategy. By neutering Nadal's ability to run around his backhand and set up his V-formation winners, Rafa's abilities on the tennis court are exceedingly diminished. A sad reality for Federer fans is that the longer a point is dragged on versus Nadal, the greater the chance Rafa will eventually win the rally. With heavy topspin ground strokes that clear the net with impressive margins and quick enough feet to reach any ball, many liken Rafa's game as being more consistent than a brick wall. His one obvious kryptonite? Even on clay? Despite possessing a level of tennis far inferior to Nadal on clay, John Isner came extremely close to defeating the Spaniard at Roland Garros 2011, as John's serve speed, the height of ball bounce reached, and Nadal's inclination to stand extremely far back provided conditions that almost guaranteed weaker returns compared to other players. A trio that combined with John's strategy of going for broke on all ground strokes almost helped secure the upset of a lifetime. So, with the ideal court conditions, perfect strategy, and suitable playstyle to achieve all three checkpoints, is it enough to defeat the King of Clay? The answer may just lie in a previous statement. In virtually every upset or close defeat mentioned, every player listed their ultimate goal against Nadal was to simply play and adhere to the same mindset. They had nothing to lose. And in hitting the ball as hard as possible, returning the ball as early as possible, and serving as hard as possible, we may just see another lesser-named player do the impossible. Defeat Rafael Nadal at the French Open. 